Now, we all love Crash Bandicoot, right? I do. I think it's pretty hard not to. I mean, it's an absolute classic. Everyone's played it or watched someone play it at one point or another. It's one of those games that's impossible to avoid, like Mario or The Legend of Zelda or Raid Shadow Legends. The point is, it's popular. It did very well commercially. It was a pretty significant part of the console wars back in the day. The game has also been praised beyond belief, and while I love the game, I'm going to go ahead and say that I think it receives too much praise. And this happens with a lot of different series. What will happen is the game will become successful and popular, it'll gain millions of fans and produce many fantastic games, but when everyone looks back on the series, they'll go to the original game, the first game in the series, and go, this. This is where it all began for this amazing series. What a legendary game. Take Pokemon for example. Pokemon is the highest grossing media franchise in the world. It's been incredibly successful with many great games, movies, spin-offs, all kinds of things. But when fans of the series look back on the original games, Pokemon Red and Blue, they think this is where it all started. What a fantastic pair of games. They of course forget the fact that Pokemon Red and Blue are shit. Most of the sprites are hideous, the battle mechanics are buggier than Viridian Forest, it's a pretty rough experience. But that's not important, because Pokemon Red and Blue kicked off a very successful series of games, they get all the credit regardless of how good they actually are. The same thing happened with Crash Bandicoot. People look at the great games in the series like Crash 2, Crash 3, Crash Team Racing, and yep that's it. Then look at the original and say if it weren't for this game we wouldn't have had all of these other amazing games. Therefore, the original game gets all the credit for how good all the games that came after it are. And that's fucked. If you had a highly regarded person like Nelson Mandela and respected him greatly, you would not look back on his parents fucking in a public bathroom and go, this, this is where it all began. What an incredible moment this is. You should not award the credit of how great something is to how it was born. Sure, Crash 1 birthed Crash 2, but Crash 2 is better than Crash 1 in every way. In fact, it's so much better that to birth Crash 2, Crash 1 needed a C-section. Basically, that was a long-winded way of me trying to say that you can't praise Crash Bandicoot for how good the sequels are. Anyway, despite that little rant, I do think Crash Bandicoot is a solid game. It's fun. Basically, you play as Crash and all you do is run, jump and spin through corridor-style levels breaking crates and slaughtering wildlife in an attempt to save Pamela Anderson from the clutches of the evil Dr. Neo Cortex, who is sort of built like an ice cream cone. As far as silly 90s platformers go, the story is actually pretty cool. Cortex wants to take over the world, and to do that, instead of doing something that will actually work, he tries to create an army of unstoppable mutant animals. During the events of Crash Bandicoot, his army of mutants reaches a grand total of five of which only two are obedient. Crash and Gwyneth Paltrow are actively resisting Cortex, and Ripperoo is just doing whatever the hell he feels like. I've got to say, Bandicoot is a really strange choice, especially for the general of your mutant army. Like, the game is set in Australia, yeah? Australia is known for its dangerous and deadly animals. You've got snakes, spiders, Rolf Harris. Why would you go for Bandicoot? I could snap a Bandicoot like a carrot. Although I guess Crash does overcome some pretty full on obstacles, so maybe Bandicoot was the right choice. But I gotta say, I think everyone is sleeping on the other mutants. I think they have so much more potential than everyone thinks they do. I mean, let's discuss this properly. Ripperoo is one of the most durable creatures I've ever seen. Crash, the hero of this game, gets completely obliterated by a single TNT explosion. Just like that. Boom. Dead. Ripperoo, on the other hand, can not only survive a hit from a TNT explosion, but he can take multiple explosions like they're nothing. You need to use big TNT to take him down, twice the size and twice the power of a regular TNT explosion, and he can take three of those hits before he's knocked out. That means Ripperoo is at least six times more durable than Crash. And on top of that, he's in a straight jacket. His arms are confined. What happens when the jacket comes off? We don't know what he's capable of. Once his arms are unleashed, he could be able to wield the power of the gods and become the ultimate life form. Or he could be like any other kangaroo where the arms are pretty much useless, but you never know. With Koala Kong, you might think his main strength is his strength. And it certainly is an asset. I mean, it looks like strength is all he has. He's 95% upper body strength. 
is like a cinder block being held up by lollipop sticks. But that kind of backfires on itself. All the strength is in his upper body, he has no leg power. So if you just sort of move away from him, he won't be able to keep up. His legs aren't strong enough for him to catch you. But Koala Kong has a secret weapon. Koalas, and this is genuinely true, koalas can give you chlamydia if they piss on you. So as a last resort, if his strength isn't enough, Koala Kong can rip off his pants and blast you with his piss cannon. And you might not feel the effects immediately, and you might not lose the battle then and there, but in the long term, you'll have to deal with chlamydia, and that is not something Crash will want to tell Kate Blanchett after he's rescued her. That makes Koala Kong pretty dangerous. He's got the upper body strength, and even though his legs are weak across the board, at least one out of the three is potentially dangerous. And then you have Pinstripe, a Potteroo Mafia boss with a gun. Seems a bit of an odd choice to go through the trouble of mutating a Potteroo to make it a Mafia boss with a gun, when it would probably be much easier to just hire a Mafia boss with a gun. But the fact that Pinstripe is a Potteroo is actually genius, and that applies to the rest of the mutants as well. Cortex's minions are criminals, let's face it, they're attempted murderers, they're kidnappers, they piss on people to give them chlamydia, it's not great. If any normal person did any of those things, they'd probably go to prison. I mean, murder and kidnapping I'm alright with, but pissing on people? What kind of absolute monster would do that to someone? The thing is though, you'd only get in trouble for those things if you are human. If you're a human, you'd be charged and tried in the court of law and punished accordingly. But a Potteroo, you're never going to see a Potteroo in court, are you? You know why? Because our justice system doesn't apply to animals. You can't charge a Potteroo with first degree murder, we don't have laws for that. A Potteroo can get away with anything, and the law is powerless to stop it. And that applies to all mutants. There are no laws for kangaroos, or koalas, or bandicoots. But let's be honest, out of all the mutants, Pinstripe is the only one holding it together. He can actually form sentences and, like, think. Pinstripe is a crime boss who is immune to our feeble human justice system. Pinstripe is the most powerful creature in the world. I mean, he was beaten up by a tiny rat wearing shorts, but that's not the point. Having said all that, you're probably thinking that Cortex's plan isn't actually all that bad. But I'm afraid you've forgotten that Cortex is a fucking moron. When Crash escapes and dives out the window, Cortex says prepare the female bandicoot, implying that making Dolly Parton his general was his backup plan should something with Crash go wrong. Fair enough, it's always good to have a plan B. The thing is though, he doesn't follow through with it immediately. Any other person would think, well, we've got all this mutation brainwashing stuff set up, we may as well do it now. But Cortex decides to wait before trying again on Britney Spears. Enough time for Crash to traverse the three whole islands which would take, realistically, at least 24 hours so he can rescue her. And she doesn't even need rescuing because she appears at the end of every bonus round, meaning she's escaped on her own multiple times. In fact, she probably went back and stayed as Cortex's prisoner out of pity, so this whole endeavour was essentially pointless. Embryo was no help at all at any point. All he did was choke on some colourful liquid like a baby that's just found a bottle of detergent. It's amazing how quickly this operation just totally collapsed. At no point did Cortex actively try to prevent Crash from making progress. Crash just happened to cross paths with some villains. The first boss, Papi Papu, had nothing to do with anything that was going on. He was just pissed off that Crash woke him up from his nap. What really happened was, Crash went on a really long stroll, every so often taking out his frustration on crates that just happened to be lying around. And at the climax of the whole thing, Crash is standing on a blimp somehow, Cortex flies over and goes fuck you Crash, then falls off his hoverboard and plummets to the ground. The burning castle in the background wasn't even part of it. Crash never set fire to anything, the castle just happened to burn down. And if that doesn't perfectly sum up the car crash that was Cortex's whole plan, I don't know what will. Luckily, well, not luckily, not a lot of luck nor skill was required to pull it off, but Crash successfully rescues his girlfriend Paris Hilton from Cortex, despite having seen her multiple times in the lead up to this moment. As the two stood atop the blimp, waiting for it to fly into the sun, I like to imagine Crash reflected on everything that happened. How he jumped out of a window and washed up on a beach, only to have to walk all the way back to the very window he jumped out of. 
how he became progressively more aggressive towards living things and inanimate objects, how he developed a crippling addiction to wampa fruit, and how the entire time he was stalked by a floating plank of wood, which, to be honest, was probably just a hallucination from the brain damage caused by all that spinning. This whole adventure may have been a breeze physically, but mentally, they fucked this bandicoot up. It's no wonder he went insane. But at least he rescued his girlfriend Marilyn Monroe, which made it all worth it. I mean, she would never, ever leave her saviour for a greasy rat in a suit. Right? <laughs>